good afternoon. My name is Tom Jenkins. Um, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of ETOA. It's my honour just to welcome you, and really that's my <laughs> entire statement, and to introduce you to Peter de Vilde, uh, President of the ETC, who has a few introductory remarks. Peter. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I try to live up to the expectations and keep it to a few introductory remarks. I've been uh, handed a, a text which is slightly longer, uh, but uh, as uh, usually, I will uh, deviate from my text and try to entertain you in a for in less formal way. I would like to start with uh, thanking all of you for being here, and especially uh, thanking also our good uh, friend and partner, Itoa. Uh, and uh, the European Commission, uh, who is sponsoring this uh, uh, event. And uh, ETC uh, and ITOA are setting up this uh, conference as part of uh, uh, the collaboration that we uh, started a few years ago with the European Commission, uh, making Destination Europe a stronger destination worldwide. And it's a good thing that this vision exists on a European level, uh, we are very struggling and working very hard with the European Travel Commission to make this awareness also come true uh, in the national, in the several national uh, member states of the European uh, uh, Travel Commission, as I'm sure the Commission is also doing with all of the member states in the Union. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, ETC and what ETC is and uh, is doing, let me just say that ETC uh, has been uh, set up in 1948 by 19 countries to promote Europe as a travel destination to long-haul uh, tourism markets outside of Europe. Uh, our organization, so our organization is older than the European Union uh, itself, and it was set up under the post-war Marshall Plan to rebuild Europe's uh, tourism industry. Uh, in those days, uh, there was a, a big awareness of the importance of uh, tourism in uh, the vitality of European uh, economics and European industry. Uh, as uh, today, uh, Europe is struggling with the consequences and the uh, financial uh, uh, challenges uh, posed by recent uh, events on the financial market, uh, I do believe that uh, tourism once again should step up, and uh, this is why we are here today. Today, this is why national tourism organizations uh, under the umbrella of ETC are uh, reaching out to the tourism industry uh, because uh, we think there's a brilliant future if we can find each other, we can make each other stronger. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I will not keep you very long. I've been waiting to say this because it's uh, a quote from Henry VIII, that what, that's what he said to each and every one of his women. I uh, will not be keeping you too long. Uh, you have a lot of uh, interesting speakers on the program today, um, but let me just uh, share with you a few uh, thoughts on uh, the future of tourism uh, in Europe uh, and destination Europe. I do believe that together as an industry we, we, we face tremendous challenges. Uh, when we speak about destination Europe, desti is, is there something like destination Europe? I, don't think we need to find an answer to that question today. Uh, I think we need to leave from the assumption that there is a destination in Europe, and you will hear demonstrated here by several speakers that indeed the perception of Europe as one travel destination exists around the world. But what to do then with new trends of nationalism in Europe? What to do with the role uh, that regions take up in Europe and the, even the role of regions becoming stronger and stronger in Europe? These two, two movements in Europe are a real uh, are a reality. What should we do as a national tourism industry and how should the uh, tourism industry uh, from the private sector, how, how uh, do you feel that you are somehow uh, threatened in uh, your businesses by, uh, or, or enhanced in your businesses, helped in your businesses by stronger regions uh, and also on the other hand by uh, the um, nationalism in Europe um, nationalism in Europe uh, and social sustainability uh, are not always compatible, so social sustainability can give an answer to uh, the individuality of nationalism in Europe, I think, by strengthening uh, European citizenship. And European citizenship is the pride of people in Europe to be able to tell around the world, I'm a European citizen. First and foremost, I'm a European citizen. When you ask an American where he's from, I think most of the Americans would say, I'm an American. Uh, when you're from Europe and they ask you uh, around the world where you're from, people 
first and foremost and answer by their local, uh, the place where they live. I'm from London or I'm from Paris. And then perhaps by their countries, instead of saying I'm European and I live this or this place. It's a, it's a real thing because if we want to make the tourism industry in Europe stronger, I do believe we need to strengthen European citizenship because the people who travel to Europe and who want to visit Europe, they want to feel welcome in a continent that has a, a, a grasp on uh, what the continent and what the future of this continent is about and what the role of European citizens uh, is uh, for the development uh, of our continent. A second uh, thought that I wanted to share is uh, that we should always keep in mind that we should start from the customer needs. The customer needs um, uh, tailoring uh, the supply to the uh, almost individual uh, demand is a real challenge. How do we fit uh, promoting Europe as a travel destination as a whole to the uh, increasing, increasingly uh, uh, individual demand from the customer. Uh, this leads me to a third point. Is there something like a product Europe? Um, we might build roots, cultural, thematical roots throughout Europe. Uh, the Danube, St. James and so on and so on. But does this mean that also the, the private industry uh, has followed these along these routes and uh, is following is developing produce. Might be interesting there to see what the Commission and, and European uh, institutions are doing on the product development side. Most of the, those uh, efforts are in the regional development programs. So we we need to pr to to make sure, and I think this effort needs to come from the national governments. Uh, we need to make sure that the regional development programs and the promotion of Europe as a travel destination, that they are at least uh, speaking to each other, that they are at least communicating and making sure that we are building the product in Europe that your customer and that our customer wants and expects. And of course, building a product Europe uh, brings with it a lot of other issues. Um, you, we, need, we are in dire need of more clarity and more unification. Uh, with uh, taxes, with visa, uh, uh, ETC has developed uh, an, an, a policy or, or, or some recommendations to the Commission about the visa policy in Europe, which we will, presenting, uh, will be presenting uh, very soon, I think next week, uh, here in London at the World Travel Market. We are very uh, keen to present this to you and we invite you to, uh, to come and uh, listen. Uh, but then, of course, there's, uh, there's a lot of other things that uh, need to be uh, discussed. And this is why I, without any further ado, want to give the floor to uh, a lot of distinguished speakers today. Once more, let me thank our good friends at ITOA for the collaboration. I've been told that they made sure to book the best theater in town with the most comfortable seats in town. So don't fall asleep <laughs> uh, like I usually do when I go to the cinema, uh, but please, uh, take part actively in the discussions of today. And we are sure that we, there will be many more of these opportunities for the next few years, because this is just the start. Thank you very much. Um, uh, th th thank you very much, Peter. I, you've covered so much of the ground. I have very few things to say, and luckily very little space to say it in. But the, um, uh, th those of you who've been had the misfortune to listen to me over decades will know that um, we are very concerned that Europe is losing market share in most of its principal origin markets. The reason for this um, could be merely perceptual. Um, uh, the big origin markets are growing um, more affluently uh, than Europe is, or well, they're growing faster than Europe is, and it's natural that they will spend their money on travel, and that travel is likely to be local rather than long haul to Europe. Nevertheless, if you look at somewhere like North America, our market share has on the whole gone down over the last 15 years, not gone up. And there is even an argument that the aggregate number of visitors from North America has stalled over the last 15 years. The good news, according to Forward Keys, um, the people who are able to look at forward booking patterns, is that demand from the US for Europe next year appears to be going up. And the good news from ETC is that their forward predictions for the US <laughs> appear to be going up. They do not seem quite as strong for the other main origin markets that we're looking at today. The reasons for this, and I'll be very brief, um, are usually perceived 
by us in Europe as being supply side. Um, we look at things like the package travel directive creating regulatory burdens on the industry. We look at the tour operators margin scheme imposing tax regulations on the industry. We look at visas stopping people coming in. Um, but the really important question to ask is what do the consumers think? What do the origin markets think? And that is the story of today's meeting because we are gathering together people with deep expertise in America, in Russia, in China to talk to us this afternoon. And in order to help us do that, um, I'm delighted to welcome to the stage Tony Travers, professor from the London School of Economics, who's an old friend of the association. He helped us do something last year. Um, please give him a warm round of applause. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Tom. And uh, welcome. Good afternoon, one and all. Um, First, I want to not only to welcome everybody who is sitting in this elegantly raked uh, theatre, uh, but also to those online. This is being broadcast live online. And also to remind everybody that there is a hashtag, uh, which is Brand Europe, to encourage you to tweet your thoughts carefully these days uh, to the outside world. Um, I... Uh, as the third person to say hello and welcome this afternoon, I too will keep it brief and we'll get on to the main events. Um, but coming as a sort of friendly outsider to an event of this kind, it is undoubtedly a, a fascinating time to be thinking about Europe and about the future of an industry which clearly is important to the continent of Europe for all sorts of reasons I don't need to explain uh, to this audience. I mean, Europe, despite its sequential challenges, I thought long and hard about what were sequential challenges, uh, and certainly within a very short time recently, um, Greece and the Euro crisis, the asylum issue, which continues along with immigration to be a significant challenge to the whole of Europe or to much of Europe. And, you know, looking ahead, Britain's referendum, all of these things are in their way enormous is, they're globally important issues which have an implication for Europe's image. Having said that, Europe is a curiously idealised place. There is, it's still an attractive place to people to live, for people to live and work, attractive to its own citizens, though you wouldn't generally think that living in most countries where they all sort of attack the politicians of the day, but in the end, uh, they are relatively attractive places. And not only to people who live in Europe, but to many beyond. And in many ways, Europe... Uh, the last 30, 40 years of Europe are one of a remarkable transition uh, where the place has improved, certainly democratically, very substantially. Now, tourism, again, as I said, don't need to say here today, is a great industry with a future as leisure spending grows, assuming GDP grows, and you know, it is haltingly now growing across Europe, certainly uh, in Britain relatively strongly, then tourism as part of the growing leisure economy definitely has a future. However, and we heard this from what the two previous speakers said, uh, Europe is a place that people some, in, some, in some ways feel they know, and they know a lot about. It has a history, profoundly understood history, but an image that will be affected by current affairs, current policies, and crucially, by competition from elsewhere. So the purpose of today then is to have a number of presentations about the political and economic of Europe and its image, or at least those thinking of coming here from outside. So we've got factual presentations from uh, three parts of the world about Russia, China, and the United States, and then panels here to open up a discussion about each of those markets for uh, Europe, uh, sorry, for Britain, uh, from these parts of the world. And then there will, after that, be an opportunity when the panels have um, comforted themselves, made themselves comfortable here for uh, questions from the audience and a wider discussion. So that's all from me by way of the third and final introductory part of the afternoon. Next, or first, uh, the substance of the afternoon, we're going to hear from Christina Boros, who is the Policy Officer for the European Commissioner, Director General for Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship and SMEs, concerned with tourism emerging 
and creative industries. And what she's going to talk about is priorities for the next five years. And that will be followed immediately by a video message from Claudia Tampadel, who is the co-chair of the Intergroup on European Tourism Development, Cultural Heritage, the Ways of St. James and Other European Cultural Roots. But perhaps if I can begin by inviting Christina to come to the lectern. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, on behalf of the European Commission, I would like to, I'm sorry, uh, I would like to thank the organizers, the European Tribal Commission and ETOA for inviting us to this event and giving us the possibility to share with you our planned actions, our pri priorities in EU tourism policy for the next few years, and also to debate with you, answer your questions if you may have any. But before I uh, actually talk about the actions and the priority areas, I would like to give you a few facts and figures and just to, you know, help you refresh our minds about the importance of tourism to, to the EU economy and to see why it is important to concentrate on these actions and these priority areas that we are going to, to work on. So, as you see from the presentation, Europe, I'm sure you all know, is a cross-cutting sector, the third largest economic area uh, in, uh, in the European Union, um, dominated by SMEs, um, over 99% of the, of, the, of the industry is uh, by SMEs, and over 90% of them are micro-enterprises, which is very important to take into account when we are uh, formulating uh, policies. Now, the, the direct contribution is about 5% of the EU GDP and creates about 9.7 million jobs. However, if we look at the induced and, and um, indirect impacts of uh, tourism on the, on the EU economy, then the contribution is even more significant. So we are talking about 10% of the EU GDP that is produced by the travel and tourism sector and the connecting sectors. Um, and it is uh, undoubtable that the tourism uh, contribution to the job market is also very serious. Um, tourism is one of the main sectors uh, involving or employing uh, mostly women and young people. So it is one of the major uh, entry points to the job market to fresh graduate and unemployed people. Now, um, with 581 million tourism, international tourist arrivals in 2014, Europe is indeed the number one tourist destination in the world. It is thanks to many uh, var various issues such as uh, diversity of cultural and natural heritage, historical heritage, uh, good connectivity. We could list uh, quite a lot of issues that make um, Europe an attractive place to visit. Um, International tourism on this uh, uh, chart we can see very clearly is going to grow. It has reached one billion uh, yardstick two years ago, and it is uh, forecasted to grow to double in 15 years from now. So this means additional demand that the European tourism industry has to uh, capitalize on. However, it is clearly shown also on this chart that the challenges are coming because the market share of Europe is going to decline. So increased competition is going to cause the market share to decline. There are other challenges that we have to face in European tourism, such as uh, information and communication technologies that is very much affecting uh, the industry. Uh, improving the quality of uh, tourism jobs, appropriate skills development is another challenge that we hear very often from our stakeholders. Um, economic, social, environmental sustainability, accessibility, and seasonality are all challenges which affect very much the productivity and, and the competitiveness of the industry. So talking a little about market shares, these are uh, very interesting charts which show the, 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 the evolution of the market shares uh, over uh, 30 years from 2000 onwards. If you concentrate only on the blue, uh, the black, and the yellow lines, you can see blue representing the whole of Europe, the black uh, representing EU28, and the yellow Asia-Pacific. You will see that from, from uh, 15 years on, uh, from now, um, 
the EU and Asia-Pacific market shares are going to be almost the same, which means that Asia-Pacific is going to catch up, and if we don't uh, address this problem, if we don't do something about this, then we are going to lose such serious market share that the industry is going to struggle. So what can we do about this? Our work at European level in the European Commission is very much defined by our, our legal and, uh, and policy framework. So let's uh, have a look at what defines our work, what, what we are going to, to introduce uh, to you in a few minutes. So the legal, legal fr framework, as many of you know, is defined by uh, the treaty, the Treaty of Lisbon, Article 195, which allows the European Commission to complement, to support, and to coordinate the actions of the member states in the area of tourism um, by encouraging uh, the creation of favorable environment for the businesses, also to, to support and encourage exchange of good practices and cooperation between the different actors in the market. However, it is very important to underline that the treaty does not allow the European Commission to propose any actions which would harmonize the, the laws of the member states. The Next level, the policy level framework, is defined by a strategic communication which was adopted by the Commission in 2010. Uh, this uh, framework outlines uh, 21 actions, policy actions, which are grouped under four uh, strategic uh, priority areas. Um, stimulating the competitiveness of the sector, promoting the development of sustainable, responsible, and high-quality tourism, consolidating the image and profile of Europe as a destination, and maximizing the potential of EU financial instruments for tur tourism development. Um, this is all going to feed into uh, higher level uh, European Commission uh, objectives, such as, for example, the single market strategy, which was adopted yesterday by the European Commission. And this strategy is, um, is, is offering us a huge potential which we have to capitalize on. So we, we must uh, ensure that the single market rules will be correctly uh, implemented for tourism services as well. Now, um, as you know, every time when there is uh, a new, co new uh, commission and a new strategy, then we have to rethink the way we work. So in line with the new commission priorities and in line with the new single market strategy, we have highlighted four priority areas in, in uh, European tourism policy that we are going to concentrate on. So number one is joint promotion of Europe as a destination, particularly in third countries markets. Uh, internationalization, so an action directly uh, aimed at SMEs and supporting SMEs to enhance their presence in key markets, um, promoting the digitalization, the uptake of digitalization, particularly by SMEs, but in the sector in general, and also upgrading the skills and competencies in the sector. So these are the four priority areas that I'm going to talk about a bit more in detail now. So first of all, let's talk about the joint promotion of Europe. Um, we all know that there is a strong, and we all agree in this room, that there is a very strong added value behind joint promotion. So we have been working on joint promotion of Europe for the past years, but joint promotion without uh, the close cooperation between member states, regions, and industry will not happen. So therefore, we call on these actors to work with us and to work between themselves to, to enhance joint promotion of Europe as a destination. We have had uh, already a long-standing uh, relationship in this area with the European Travel Commission. So the past uh, few years, we have uh, been working together uh, to promote, tourism, uh, to promote uh, Europe as a tourism destination, uh, both within Europe and to long-haul markets such as uh, Asia, India, China, Russia, uh, South America. Um, to, to, to enhance the, the, the visibility and the image uh, of this uh, wonderful destination. Now, um, we are going to continue this cooperation with the European Travel Commission. So this year, we already uh, have uh, the money uh, put aside for, uh, for the ETC to work with us uh, on further promotional activities. Uh, we are going to con uh, continue to concentrate on key uh, third countries market, long haul markets, and we are going to enhance the involvement of the industry uh, under this action as well uh, for the effectiveness of the action. We are also going to launch a communication campaign 
Uh, this campaign is going to focus more on intra-EU travel, so we are going to uh, try to put more emphasis on less known European destinations and try to encourage Europeans to travel to another member state within, um, another member state within Europe. And then we have also the support from the European Parliament. So they are going, us, going to give us some budget on their pilot projects and preparatory actions, also for promotion purposes. Uh, so we are going to develop um, an action which will enhance the visibility uh, under a transnational project uh, of uh, UNESCO heritage sites uh, within the European Union. And also we are going to have another action on branding Europe, so to enhance the visibility and promote the brand Europe as a destination. Um, in terms of internationalization, as I said before, this action will concentrate directly on SMEs. So uh, we are going to support SMEs and their representative associations, federations at national and European level to enhance uh, their participation and their visibility in third countries' markets. Uh, this action will involve um, the organization of information events and business-to-business -business matching events uh, uh, for different types of uh, tourism products, such as, for example, culture, uh, natural uh, tourism, uh, cycling, uh, uh, food, uh, etc. Um, we have uh, quite a large uh, uh, segment of our budget for this action, which is 3.1 million euros, but it covers two years. So the action is already foreseen for two years to go on, and we would like to cover 10 to 12 uh, international and uh, fairs under this, this action. So the, the, the countries we are going to, to concentrate on are China, India, Brazil, uh, US, Canada, possibly Australia. Um, and then, um, of course, this will also involve the, the Europe Enterprise Network, which has a sector group on tourism and cultural heritage we will, uh, we will also work with. Last but not least, we will also have to draw on the experience of our industry stakeholders. For example, ETOA, if I'm not uh, mistaken, tomorrow there's going to be a B2B event tomorrow, and uh, I have been told that ETOA has over 20 years experience in organizing such events, so we will very much rely on, on knowledge and experience exchange from the industry. Um, digitalization is, um, is at the heart of uh, the competitiveness of uh, the European uh, travel uh, sector. Um, and we need to follow market trends. Um, we have to enable the development of uh, new innovative business models, and we have to capitalize on the digital single market package, which was adopted uh, a few weeks ago by the European Commission. Um, in this, within this framework, um, in DigiGrow, uh, by the, the tourism unit, the unit dealing with tourism, we have formed the Digital Tourism Network. Uh, we launched uh, this network in March uh, earlier this year, and we asked on all stakeholders who would like to, to, to work with us, to debate with us on digital tourism issues, to join this network. It's an informal network, so if you still want to join, you are the most welcome. Uh, and within this network, with the, the, the help of some experts, we are currently mapping the state of play, the challenges and the opportunities of the uptake of digitalization by the tourism industry, particularly uh, by micro and small enterprises. We would like to, to come up, of course, at the end of this research with some policy recommendations to see how we could help the uptake of digitalization. Uh, and uh, of course, we will present the findings of this research to to anyone who is interested to hear about this mid next year. At a higher level, a little higher level than our unit, uh, in DG Grow still, um, the, the, the Director General has also for, uh, um, created a task force, but this task force is uh, focusing exclusively on collaborative economy, but across sectors. So uh, they are looking at how collaborative economy affects different sectors. They are currently doing a kind of mapping, uh, assessing the economic impacts uh, of, uh, of collaborative economy. And of course, it is also in the view of coming up with policy recommendations. 
Uh, further to this, uh, the, there is a very strong cooperation in this area with, uh, with other director generals within the European Commission, such as, for example, DG Justice, who is responsible for consumer affairs, uh, DG Connect for digital technologies, uh, DG Move, which is responsible for transport issues, and also DG Competition. Enhancing skills and competencies is, is also uh, one of the key issues. We, we keep hearing from our stakeholders that, that obtaining and retaining skilled uh, staff in tourism is, is particularly difficult. Tourism jobs are not necessarily very sexy due to several issues, uh, level of payment, the quality of jobs, the seasonality of jobs, etc. We have carried out a study, uh, and we presented it uh, just a couple of weeks ago in Brussels, um, on uh, the demand and the offer of skilled uh, workforce in tourism. And this uh, study found that there is a serious mismatch. I think we already knew this, but we needed something to support it. Um, there is a serious mismatch between the demand and the offer of skilled workforce in the sector. Um, to, this, uh, to, to, to address this issue, we have already been working previously uh, in the European Commission. We have uh, worked with the DG um, employment to develop a hospitality skills passport, which means that we, we, we help to, to, to come up with a definition of, uh, of certain tourism skills. Um, and uh, we integrated all this in the EURES website, which many of you might be uh, familiar with. It's a website uh, by the European Commission, which helps the matching of businesses with job, job seekers. And now there's a dedicated tourism and hospitality section in this website. Um, recently only, uh, we have started working uh, on the drop in portal, which is also a very new project. It was only launched uh, this summer by the European Commission. It's, um, it's a digital platform which focuses on traineeships and apprenticeships across sectors. So it's a general cross-sectoral platform, but we would like to also enhance the visibility of, of uh, tourism traineeships and tourism apprenticeship possibilities on this website. So it's a website that also matches those who offer traineeships and apprenticeships with those who are actually seeking. It's a very practical, very simple website. If you have a, a chance, please take a look at it. Then there is another initiative also by the European Commission, a European Allowance, uh, European Alliance for Apprenticeships, uh, which is more um, kind of cooperation platform between the industry, uh, educational institutes, and, um, and public authorities of the member states. And it aims at uh, exactly addressing the gap between the, the national educational curricula and the demand, the needs of the industry in terms of tourism skills and competencies. So what we are trying to encourage here is that these actors work together to, to provide the sort of education in tourism that the industry needs. Now, uh, more in a practical level that also involves uh, money, we have a call for proposals coming up, also with the help of the European uh, Parliament. Uh, they have uh, given, up, given us uh, 1 million euro to, to implement an action which would help uh, uh, the, improve the traineeships, the quality of traineeships, and the mobility of traineeships and apprenticeships in, uh, in tourism. This is going to be implemented next year. Uh, we have also been working on improving digital skills, which are very important nowadays in the sector. We have uh, implemented several, several webinars, mostly focusing on uh, marketing skills of micro enterprises. Uh, they are still available on, on our website, and we would like to continue producing uh, similar webinars um, on various uh, topics. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, that's very useful. No, no, no. Um, I would also like to call your attention to call for proposals launched by DG Employment, who are um, capitalizing on the, on the Erasmus Plus and the European Social Fund, who have much, much more serious money to offer, I think, altogether 35 billion euros for training and, and, uh, and development, for training and, and apprenticeship development purposes. Uh, last uh, but not least, improving the business environment. Uh, to compete uh, with new emerging destinations, we must invest in quality. Uh, we must improve infrastructure, resource uh, efficiency, skills, etc. And for this, we need money. 
So it is essential to ensure better access to finance. As you know, we have uh, the COSME program, the program for the competitiveness of small and medium-sized enterprises. This is where my unit gets uh, its budget. Um, the bad news is that for next year, we are going to have a very reduced budget. Uh, we asked for 12 million. We are lucky to get four and a half. Uh, which means that we had to rethink, obviously, the way we work, and this is why also one of the reasons we are uh, focusing on main priorities in our work. However, as it has been said before, the main money comes from the structural funds, and we still believe that although most of the stakeholders are aware of the possibilities under the structural funds, uh, they still could be used in a more focused, more effective uh, way <coughs> And uh, what we are trying to do is raise uh, awareness, working together with DG Regio, for example, uh, about the, the, the financing possibilities. We have produced a guide on EU funding, which is available on our website. You may download it, and we are also going to have it translated into all of the EU languages. So it's going to be available to, to the wider public. Um, and uh, I have also mentioned uh, before the, the Erasmus Plus and uh, the European Social Fund possibilities. Now, visa facilitation, it has been mentioned before as a very important um, uh, issue. It has been estimated that we are losing annually 6.6 .6 million potential tourists, which could mean 12.6 billion loss of GDP and 250,000 jobs lost each year. Um, we know, uh, let me show you the next chart, which is quite interesting. It's about tourism arrivals, tourist, uh, international tourist arrivals uh, by 2030. I would concentrate more on the left side of the chart, which is showing uh, the coming from uh, of the different areas of uh, different uh, regions of, uh, of the world. We will see by 2030, Asia Pacific will uh, reach almost uh, 550 million tourist arrivals. And although uh, only, uh, I think, 80% uh, are expected to reach other regions than the Asia Pacific, it still translates into quite a serious amount of uh, 98 million uh, tourist arrivals, which will reach other regions of the world, which we should not miss, about, miss out on. Therefore, it is important to work on the visa issue. We understand that uh, that the Commission's proposal, which was quite balanced and did not compromise uh, security at national level, is going through very serious discussions and very difficult discussions in Council currently. <clears throat> so uh, here, the industry has a very serious role. We unfortunately cannot uh, influence these discussions anymore. It is up to the industry now to team up to several interested sectors, subsectors to team up and lobby at national level. So we call uh, always when we meet the industry on them to go and talk to ministries of tourism, ministries of national security to lobby for the issue of visa because we think that it would bring a very serious added value, visa facilitation would bring a serious added value to the tourism <coughs> industry. Yeah, my last slide. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So um, basically, um, we are not giving up on sustainable tourism, which we have been working on uh, quite a long time already. You might be uh, uh, familiar with the Eden uh, competition, uh, which has been going on for since 2007, if I'm not mistaken. It's a national competition, which unfortunately, due to the reduction of the budget, we have to redesign. We will no longer be able to finance competitions in each uh, member state, but it does not mean the competition will stop. So we will still organize competitions at EU level, most probably, but, uh, but uh, with, under a, a new concept. We have the European Tourism Indicator System. Some member states might be, uh, or even some destinations might be um, uh, familiar with. It's a system uh, for the sustainability uh, improvement of destinations. And uh, we are currently revising the system, which we will uh, uh, come up with a revised version of the, the system uh, early next year. Finally, the European Charter of Sustainable and Responsible Tourism, a long-standing project which now has been overtaken by another task force in uh, DG Grow uh, under uh, the, the leadership of our previous director, Mr. Ortoon, who finds this a very important uh, and very uh, project close to his heart. 
we also find this very important, obviously. Um, let me just give you a couple of uh, upcoming events. The European Tourism Day on the 16th of December. Registration is not yet open, but it will be very soon, possibly next week, open on our website. The theme is going to concentrate on the promotion, promotion of Europe. And uh, there is going to be the European Tourism Indicator System Conference uh, early next year. Our contact details, our website, please do visit. And if you have any questions, I'm at your disposal. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Are we going to move straight on to the... Um, uh, probably, yeah. Yeah, okay. Straight on to the... video message. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed speakers and participants, my name is Claudia Zapardel. I am a Romanian member of the European Parliament and member of the Transport and Tourist Committee and also co-chair of the Tourist Development and Cultural Heritage Intergroup. I regret not to be able to address you in person today. However, I am very grateful to the European Travel Commission for the invitation to speak about the priorities for the tourist sector in the next years. I will share with you today the key priorities I see essential to keep the competitiveness of the tourism industry and Europe as the number one tourist destination. Tourism is playing a central role in our legislative. This can be illustrated by the creation of the parliamentary intergroup. It's not easy to create intergroups in our parliament. It requires the support of at least three political groups. But in the process, I managed to obtain the support of the group leaders and 140 MEPs from all the national delegation and almost all political groups. That sends a very strong message of support from our parliament to the tourism industry. Our intergroup raises awareness to the tourism industry and provides a platform for discussions between the EU institutions, representatives from the member state, private sector and civil society. In return, the intergroup helps to shape an integrated approach to the promotion of European tourism. In the past year, I met with many stakeholders from, from the public and private tourism sector. The discussions we had, the events I organized and the debates in our intergroup points to the following priorities. The first priority relates to raising the profile of tourism industry in Europe. While the tourism industry generates over 10% of the EU GDP, this contribution is often neglected by our institutions. As an example, tourism has no permanent budget line in the EU budget. Moreover, it is visibly within the European Commission is decreasing. That is reflected by the cuts in the budget and staff members in the DGs where tourism is being dealt with. That is not the right way if we want to keep Europe as the world number one destination for tourists. In the European Parliament, we are ready to help. As member of the Transport and Tourist Committee, I tabled amendments to the 2016 budget report to restore the budget of programs under COSME for promoting tourism. Moreover, together with my colleagues, we have secured the allocation of half a million euro to the EU budget for 2016 exactly for the promotion of Europe in the world. That is done by the pilot project Destination Europe. Another initiative I am promoting in these regards is the nomination of a European Year on Cultural Heritage and Tourism. This initiative shows how important it is to promote, protect and preserve Europe's touristic sites and cultural heritage. This initiative also helps to raise awareness to the economic contribution of the tourism and culture, cultural industries. That is reflected in job creation, promotion of SMEs and the development of infrastructure. Placing tourism in the heart of the EU agenda will provide the means to achieve our targets and also raise the profile of the tourism industry in the EU and non-European markets. Another priority I would like to mention refers to the need to develop tourism in areas that are less known but are still rich in culture and attraction. For example, Maramureș, a region in North Romania which offers beautiful landscapes, unique food and cultural traditions. While there is a high touristic potential in this region, the public transportation and infrastructure is very poor. Improving links and connectivity will contribute to the economic and social development of the region 
region and country as a whole. Although I use Maramures as an example, there are plenty more regions across Europe with the same problem. We must take more actions to upgrade railway connections, complete road and highway development and have more directly connected flights. Being a member of the Transport and Tourist Committee, I work on the issue of connectivity to remote areas. My recent work as the SND Rapporteur on the White Paper on Transport proves that. In my work on this file, I stress the need to prioritize the EU policies on better connectivity in the EU, mostly to remote areas. I am devoted to continue working together with my colleagues on this issue on in future dossiers. The third, but not the least priority I would like to mention, relates to the shortage of skilled labor in the tourism industry. As I mentioned earlier, the tourism industry is an important source for job creation in Europe. The industry has the capacity to help reduce unemployment, mainly for young people. It also brings back to the labor force the young adult unemployed and gives work-life balance to parents, but more needs to be done to deal with the needs of industry and social rights of workers at the same time. We need more investment in quality employment to make the tourism sector more attractive to students and graduates. We also have to look at the needs of the tourism industry industry by providing high-quality training opportunities to people employed in the sector. In this context, more efforts are needed to make tourism a high-level education discipline within the social science branch. Here I propose to create a European Academy for training of workers in the tourism industry. Such institution is vital to eliminate skill gaps and increase the relevance of vocational training. The best day for Europe to tackle the challenges faced by the tourism industry is within a change of policy. We need a new approach to replace the outdated 2010 communication on European tourism. I welcome the eight common actions to foster the European tourism industry outlined by the Commissioner Biankowska in her speech in Madrid this year. But I also believe that the right way forward is to renew and update the Commission's strategy on tourism. To remind you, the 2010 document does not reflect the changes brought by the digital agenda or the sharing economy. It does not reflect the EU enlargement or the growing competition with non-European markets. We need an inclusive strategy to deal with these challenges and transform them into opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, besides involving 2 million businesses, providing 10 million jobs, the tourism industry is one of the few sectors which still grows and creates jobs despite the economic crisis. We cannot turn our back to these numbers. In order to preserve the contribution of the sector, we need to ensure its visibility in daily policies defined by our institution and na national governments. We need to ensure that access is provided to all the touristic destinations across Europe for truly exploring its potential. Last but not least, we need to guarantee a degree of human capital in the sector while taking into consideration the needs of the industry. These three priorities will help set the means to bring more tourists into Europe while supporting the growth of our industry and our economy. I would like to thank you for your attention and I wish you a fruitful debate. Thank you. Right, very good. Well, we've now had a um, contribution from an official in Brussels and from a parliamentarian. And it's got us off to a good start. What I want to do now to, well, to thank both uh, Christina and Claudia Tapadel for their contributions. And now I'd like to move on to our keynote speech. This is uh, to be given by Gideon Rackman, uh, who is Chief Foreign Affairs Columnist from the Financial Times, where he's worked since 2006, and whose job entails reporting from all over the world. Before joining the FT, uh, Gideon was a foreign correspondent for The Economist, including stints in Brussels and Bangkok. He sort of travelled round most of the places that are the origins for tourists to Europe uh, and has a particular interest in both emerging Asia and in the, the European Union. So uh, without more ado, I'd like to invite uh, Gideon Rackman to come up on stage and to talk about the perception of Europe around the world and that will be followed by an opportunity for questions and answers.
Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much, Tony, for the introduction, and thanks to Tom Jenkins for inviting me. In fact, inviting me back, Tom was reminding me that uh, I think I spoke last to this organization about 16 years ago. It was just before I went to Brussels. It was and just before the, the launch of the Euro. Um, and it's actually quite interesting to reflect on how things feel in, in Europe over the, uh, you know, after these uh, intervening 15, 16 years. I think it's in some ways, uh, we've made a lot of progress. I think in other ways, it's a rather gloomier, more troubled time. And I'd like to talk a little bit, before I go specifically into perceptions of Europe and how they affect uh, the tourism industry, which I'll, I'll do in the second bit of my talk, I'd like to talk a little bit about reality, because, of course, there is uh, some uh, connection between reality and perception, but not, not, that's not automatic. Um, and I think that it is the case that Thinking back to that period that uh, Tony alluded to, that I was in Brussels from 2001 to 2006, it was a period when Europe felt like it was doing rather better. Uh, it was a more optimistic period. Now, you can make things feel like golden ages in, in, in retrospect, and of course that period had its troubles as well. I mean, I, shortly after I arrived, 9-11 uh, happened, and even though it happened on the other side of the Atlantic, it was an event that kind of caused turmoil in Europe, you had the Iraq war, you had massive political divisions. Uh, nonetheless, this was also a period when the EU was building up to the enlargement of the EU, when it sort of close to doubled in size uh, from 15 to now 28 members, and that gave a tremendous sense of momentum to the project, a sense that everybody wanted to join in with it. It was also just before the launch of the Euro, that actually then happens in around uh, 2001, 2002, which technically works extremely well and seems to be working well economically in the initial years. So there was a kind of forward momentum, and there was uh, this ambitious program. I don't know whether anyone even talks about it anymore, but at the time there was this idea of a Lisbon agenda which was going to turn Europe into the most competitive economy in the world by 2020. Um, and then I, I, if you want to sort of think, well, when did things start uh, going slightly wrong, I would guess it would be another event on the other side of the Atlantic, it would be the financial crisis that began with the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Since then, obviously, the economic problems have piled up, and I don't think we're fully out of them, uh, because the financial crisis then leads to the Euro crisis, which, as well as causing debt problems right across southern Europe, the various bailouts we're all familiar with, uh, creates political divisions within Europe, so that some of the acrimony that you see between northern and southern Europe, between Germany and Greece and so on, would have been quite hard to imagine back in uh, sort of 2005, before the crisis hit. And now we, of course, have a migration crisis as well. It's quite a, a new thing, so it's, it's perhaps premature to start talking about what it all means. We're really in the midst of it. But it seems to me that one of the dangers we're facing is that having seen a division open up between northern and southern Europe over the Euro crisis, this migration crisis now may uh, create a division between eastern and, and western Europe, and more particularly between Germany and its uh, eastern partners because of the German effort to try to persuade the rest of the European Union to, to parcel out refugees in a more equitable fashion, to share some of the costs. We've seen at recent EU summits that there's been quite a lot of pushback from that. I suspect it may get actually worse now with the election of the new Polish government, which is very opposed to migrant sharing schemes. So um, the, the Germans, who obviously have emerged over the last 10 years as, I think, uh, clearly the, the central power in the European Union, again, that's a big change. Back when I was uh, starting all this, it was still very common to talk about the Franco-German couple as the, the key grouping inside the EU. And I think that although people still pay a bit of lip service to that, there is still a feeling that uh, now that, that really it's Berlin that, that, that matters. Now, that can change if the German economy weakened or if France suddenly looked stronger or if Britain made a definitive decision to stay inside the EU, perhaps the political uh, map would change. But I think for the moment, Germany is the central power within the EU. And there was a... a uh, very high official of the EU who recently visited the, um, the FT and said, I, I won't re sort of say he was, because he was, he was being a bit kind of cheeky, but he said, I think that you know, the French and the Germans like to talk about the Franco-German couple because the French need to talk about it because uh, it disguises how weak they are, and the Germans need to talk about it because it disguises how strong they are. Uh, 
but in the end, it's, it's, it's really Berlin. But if Berlin is, has, has a bad relationship with southern Europe because of the Euro crisis and a bad, potentially bad relationship with the new countries of Eastern Europe uh, over the migrant crisis, and Britain's thinking of leaving, and France is about to, French, to, to face a, a presidential election in which the far right will do well, although I don't think Marine Le Pen will win. Um, it's, it's a more, much clearly a much more turbulent period. Now, do you need to worry about all this? Do our tourists need to worry about all this? Well, you know, yes, yes and no. I think actually one of the nice things about tourists is how charmingly impervious they are to what's on the front pages of the newspapers. They really don't care most of the time. And this was, this was driven home to me when I um, went to Athens at the time when we all thought, it was it in July? Um, no, I forget, July, August, when, when really the Greek banks were on the point of closure. There was talk that Greece was going to be forced out of the euro that weekend at an emergency EU summit. And so I sort of thought, I'd better get down to Athens. It was the vote that, if you, you remember, would, uh, would they reject the, the bailout or not? Uh, so I flew down from Helsinki on a Sunday morning to, to get into, into Athens in time for the vote. And thinking the plane would be empty or would only be other journalists. In fact, it was stuffed with Finnish tourists who absolutely apparently unaware that there was any kind of crisis, even though we, we, we were told that actually all the cash points would be closed in Athens. And you know, I'd loaded up with cash. It would have been a fantastic time to be a, a, a mugger in Athens because there were everybody coming into Greece was just had, had huge wads of cash on them. Um, but the tourists, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you, if you went into Syntagma Square where the politics was going on, there was, you know, a lot of uh, demonstrations and emotion and so on. If you moved two blocks from in Syntagma Square or took the bus down to the Acropolis, the tourists were just kind of going about their business as usual. And so it does take quite a lot to actually make people think, you know, I think I won't go to Europe because things are looking a bit rocky. I, I don't think we're really at that stage yet. The only thing is, I think that the, the one thing that, that could change, or two that I would point to that, that, that would be potentially worrying, one is, is terrorism, obviously. And of course, this year began with the Charlie Hebdo murders in Paris and the huge demonstrations, which uh, drew attention around the whole world to, to, to what, had, what had happened. And I gather there was a, a small drop off in, in bookings to France after that, though I think it's probably recovered now. And it's something that we in Britain got used to in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, I remember we were always infuriated there'd be some sort of uh, IRA bombing in, you know, somewhere, and, and tour, you know, Americans would start cancelling their holidays, and you'd say, well, hang on, you know, like that was the one bombing in a city of 15 million people. It's not going to affect you, but it does affect perceptions. People begin to think, well, may maybe not. I'll go somewhere else. So I think terrorism is a potential worry, and of course, we could have had another attack quite recently, were it not, ironically, for some American tourists come soldiers who overcame the the guy on the Thales train coming from Amsterdam to Paris. I think the other thing to watch, and again, it's something that's, that's only really developing, uh, is this question of borders. Because you know, if you want to market Europe as one destination, well, or just uh, as somewhere you could, where you can get around easily, obviously, Schengen border-free zone is a huge, uh, huge help. Um, and if borders start, Closing as we're beginning to get hints of between you know Austria and Slovenia, Hungary and and uh, uh, Serbia. Serbia obviously not in the EU, but this idea that fences are returning. You even had briefly in this crisis the, the Danes closing the train links between Denmark and Germany. If that kind of thing becomes more frequent, then I think it could begin to affect the atmosphere for, for tourists. And indeed, I mean, just as a modest example, I was talking to. Uh, French diplomat uh, about the Eurostar the other day, and we were agreeing that actually you now think twice about if you absolutely have to be on time because there are so many disruptions because of migrants getting on the line and so on, and the train is delayed for two, a couple of hours. If that kind of thing begins to seep into people's consciousness that you know it's it's not as easy as, as it used to be because somehow the political situation or the economic situation is affecting uh, things, then then that too can affect. The perception of Europe as, as uh, somewhere where you necessarily want to go to relax. However, um, I do think that it's un, you know, as things stand, however much people like me, we've got plenty to write about, I don't, I don't think you're, you're yet in the situation where um, Europe's attractions and destination are seriously compromised. And those attractions are, are pretty huge. Um, so let me turn to 
what outsiders think of Europe and how that might affect the tourism industry. I mean, we heard uh, in the previous presentation very interesting uh, figures about how Europe is losing market share, both Tom and the speaker from the European Commission referred to it. And I can understand why you're anxious about it, but actually, I think, I don't think you should be that anxious about loss of market share per se. I think it's actually probably an inevitable result of the economic growth of Asia, if you think of how Asians are going to, uh, to behave. Uh, let, let me explain uh, what, what I mean is that if you think about how we as Europeans behave, sort of relatively affluent middle class people, we'll take at most one holiday, uh, big holiday outside Europe, I think, uh, let's see, or retired or something, or particularly affluent. Uh, but you might take a couple of short breaks to the rest of Europe if, you, if you've got time. Um, so there's a natural propensity to take to, 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 to holiday close to home initially. And I think that as Asians become more affluent, and you've got to remember this is really quite a, a, a recent development. The emergence of the Chinese middle class and of the Indian middle class has really been happening over the last 10 to 20 years. They will kind of replicate those patterns. They will, more of them will come to Europe, no doubt about it, and they want to. And we will see a big increase in tourism from Asia. But the share of Europe of the global tourism market, I think, probably will go down because a lot of Asians will also travel to Asia. And that's kind of inevitable. I, I don't think as long as Europe's, uh, the, the amount of money being spent in Europe uh, is going up, and as long as we don't get a feedback that people are saying, actually, Europe's no longer attractive, and I don't think that I get pick that up, I wouldn't worry too much about the overall market share figures because, again, if you compare uh, tourism to any other industry, almost in any industry you care to think of, whether it's car sales, you know, computer sales, the amount that Asia is, uh, accounts for is going up. I mean, a Apple's biggest market for the iPhone is now China. It's not the United States. Uh, so the Asian consumer is the, now, I think, the biggest uh, new factor in the global economy. And in tourism, it seems to me likely that they will initially spend uh, most relatively close, close to home, because that's also what you do when you take your first holiday. You, you, you're unlikely to go to the other side of the world. Uh, but if you take several holidays, some of them, more of them will be close to home. But I think within that, uh, you will see more and more of a trend of people beginning to want to come to Europe. Maybe they'll, they'll do their first holiday uh, next door, but then they'll begin to think about Europe. And then there was an interesting figure I uh, came across that, I think in, two th in the year 2000, more Chinese tourists went to the island of Macau than to Europe. And uh, that's changed. But that was a moment in time where suddenly that people had enough money to get out of the country or just to go next door. Uh, but now they're, they're, they're beginning to be able to be a bit more adventurous. And uh, again, another figure, there were 57 million Chinese tourists who went overseas in 2010. That figure is, I think, almost certain to double over the next decade. And if you talk to people who are much more expert than me on Chinese tourism, they tend to feel that Europe is extremely well-placed. There's an, uh, uh, an article I'd recommend to you, just because it's a good read, um, as much as a guide, but by a guy called Evan Osnos. It's spelled O-S-N-O-S. -S. It was in the New Yorker in 2011, and it's also in his recent book on China. But what Evan did, he was an American journalist, was he accompanied a Chinese tour group around Europe. And for every one of those people on that tour were, it was their first ever trip outside China. And so it was an interesting profile of the kind of people they were. They were the new emerging Chinese middle class. There was a TV set designer, somebody who worked, who made a bit of money in construction and so on. And just to encourage you all, I mean, um, from the article, Evan Osnos writes, when the Chinese industry, travel industry, polls the public on its dream destinations, no place ranks higher than Europe. So uh, it is clear that the, that Europe as a destination is extremely attractive to not just to the Chinese, but to the Southeast Asians, to the Indians, and, and so on. And I think that that is likely to continue. Now, how they uh, consume Europe is also kind of interesting. Uh, in some ways, it's a bit like the parodies or the kind of images that Europeans may have had of unsophisticated Americans in the 1950s about people charging from one country to another and, you know, ticking if it's Tuesday, it must be Belgium. There is an element of that. So that the, the classic European tour that uh, Evan Osnos and his Chinese com 
companions went on, took in five countries in 10 days. Everything was included. It was quite expensive. It was 2,200 US dollars. All meals, uh, all travel. Every meal they ate was Chinese. Um, but this was not necessarily because of lack of uh, adventurousness. Uh, apparently, the tourists would occasionally say, look, can we eat some of this European food? And the tour guide would say, there's no time. Uh, because the Europeans spend hours over their meals. You know, it'll take five hours, and we've got to get on to the next site. So they would, uh, they would rush off. Um, but what Evan suggested in his article, and certainly my impression, is that people become more adventurous with time. So that even within that group, by the end of the 10 days, there was a sort of campaigning to, can we actually really go to a European restaurant? And they did it because uh, you know, people become more uh, habituated to the place and more willing to take a chance. And that was another aspect, um, again, mentioned in the Evan Olsenos article, but also picked up by me, that Chinese are oddly, and, and I'm sure a lot of first-time tourists, are concerned about security. Uh, there was a big emphasis in all the stuff these travel uh, uh, travelers were given when their little packs they were given as they set off, saying, beware of being robbed in the street, beware of beggars, that kind of thing. And, you know, we might think, oh, well, how naive, but I guess if, you know, European tourists head off to Bangkok, where I used to live, you kind of get the same advice. Be careful, watch, your, watch yourself. And um, that, again, will, that kind of image... You know, if there are a few bad stories, of course, that could be ramped up. But I think generally, as people become more familiar and more comfortable with travel in Europe, they will relax a little bit on the uh, security front. The other thing is that the places people want to go to, uh, some of them are entirely predictable. You know, the Colosseum, there you have it, etc. Uh, but also some of them are quite surprising. So, um, I, you know, when I recently went to... to my old uh, university town of, of Cambridge dropped a, uh, a child off. I was really struck by how many Chinese tourists there were, huge numbers. And now why was that? That's partly because it's just got on the agenda, but it's also because apparently there's a famous poem written by a Chinese student who was at Cambridge in the early 20th century, which is in every Chinese uh, literature textbook. So all these people have read this poem and they want to go and see the willow trees outside King's College, Cambridge. And so as a result, I'm not sure how, whether this is necessarily great for what is quite a small town, the whole of the backs of Cambridge are just full of coaches of uh, Chinese tourists. Um, and the streets are full of them. And that, that has a kind of knock-on effect because the colleges, which used to be open, a lot of them are closing because they, people need to study and so on. Um, but uh, it's, it's something that reminds you that little things can... can um, people's Destinations within Europe aren't going to be totally predictable. Another one that the Chinese are keen on going to uh, is Trier uh, on the German-Luxembourg border. Now, why would they want to go there? Well, because it was the birthplace of Karl Marx, oddly. Uh, and I don't think that they're all uh, still communists. I don't think many of them are. But nonetheless, it's a place that they will have heard of. They'll have done a lot of... Uh, they, they will all have had to take compulsory Marxism courses at universities, so they're kind of interested. Um, but the place they spend most time is uh, the Louis Vuitton store, um, uh, which I'm not sure what Marx would feel about that. But um, <laughs> And the Chinese, actually, one interesting aspect of them as a group is that they tend to spend more in sh on shopping than on a, even than on accommodation. Uh, shopping is incredibly important. And again, I've always been a bit baffled by this, because if you go to uh, any big Asian city, all of the Western brands we know, they're there. You know, there are 10 Louis Vuitton stores at Bulgari, whatever, you name it. It's the, the same with the airports. And yet somehow there seems to be an extra attraction in coming to the same store and entering it in Paris or in London, maybe because that's where it was from. Uh, so there is uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of interest in doing uh, shopping. Now, what are the images that people bring with them of Europe and what do they expect? Again, there's been some quite interesting polling on this. Within China, the most um, strongest positive image was culture. They thought of Europe as a cultured place. Uh, the strongest negative image or word, negative word associated with Europe was arrogant. They thought we looked down on them. Now, that may be simply because, you know, a legacy of colonialism. If you, if you look, you know, and, and that's not a unique thing for uh, China, was, uh, but, but a sense that 
you know, in the 19th century, the Europeans were the overlords, and people may still have that at the back of their minds when they think of Europe. And that, I think, one, one has, to, has to bear in mind, that there is, uh, um, you know, it's not something that, that will bubble up on a daily basis, but it's something that people might be sensitive to this, you know, do people respect us, do they, do they treat us well? Um, I think another thing that is true, and this is just anecdotal evidence from, from talking to Indians and Chinese, is the environment, the cleanness of the environment. Uh, there's a rather sort of depressing competition within the FT uh, between our Beijing and Delhi bureau chiefs as to who is breathing the more polluted air. Um, they, the, they, they sort of exchange the particulate readings in their, in their cities at any given time. But it's, you know, Beijing, if you go, particularly in the winter when people are burning coal, uh, it's staggeringly polluted. Horrible, actually. Um, and, and Delhi's not that much better. And so I think it's a huge relief for a lot of Asians, particularly from the big cities, when they come to, to Europe and the, the sky is blue and the weather's temperate and your throat doesn't hurt when you breathe. It's that basic. But it's something that we should be aware of and is a real strength of, of the European uh, Union, Europe as a, as a place, is that it's not only physically attractive, the environment hasn't been wrecked as it has been in, in a lot of... Uh, emerging Asia, and to be fair, as it might have looked in Europe in the 19th century when we were going through the Industrial Revolution, we're now in a sort of a cleaner phase of, of our economic development, but, but Asia still looks a bit like uh, Europe in the Industrial Revolution. Um, just the last couple of things on slightly more on the political angle, but I think, again, a, a more reassuring uh, vision for Europeans. If you look at global polls of which countries are regarded well, and uh, which are regarded badly. Actually, there's a, there's a poll by, done by B, the BBC and Globescan. Uh, I think they do it every year, but the most recent one in 2014, uh, the most popular country in the world uh, was, or the country with the most positive image, who asked, did you, have, did you think of, it made a positive contribution to the world or a negative contribution? The most positive uh, contribution was Germany, actually. It had 60% uh, positive rating, 18% negative. After that, Canada. After that, the UK, 56 uh, positive, 21 negative. After that, France, 50 positive, 22 negative. Uh, the headline, perhaps showing, uh, th there was an overall rating for the EU as well. 47% 47 said it made a positive contribution to the world, 22% negative. Now, in, uh, the, the sign of um, perhaps how gloomy journalists tend to be is that it, the headline was, for the first time ever, less than 50% of the world thinks the EU is making a positive contribution to the world. <laughs> but uh, you could put it the other way, that you know, two to one, they think it is, it is making a positive contribution. And I mean, you know, it is true that the EU as an institution, its ratings are going down, but that's probably a reflection of the Euro crisis and so on, that not all the news people are hearing at the moment is good. But overall, people have a positive image of Europe outside Europe. So I talked a bit about some of the old sensitivities left over for con from colonialism, but perhaps because we're no longer the superpower, the bosses of the world, people don't tend to feel particularly hostile to Europe. They admire the environment, they admire the history, and they want to come here. And so a last word, but this is not as a political analyst or as a tourism analyst, but almost as a you know, consumer, as, an, as, as a citizen, when I heard Tom and others saying, look, our, our goal is to encourage more tourism, to get more tour parties into Europe, uh, of course, I, I agree with that. You know, I can see the importance of, the, uh, of it, tourism to the economy, and we saw the figures just up there. I have to say, however, it didn't strike me as somebody who goes around Europe that we're, we're lacking in that uh, department. I mean, certainly, if you go to the Louvre, uh, which I did not so long ago, you can't get near the Mona Lisa because of the number of people who are taking selfies of themselves in front of it. Um, and it's a very strange experience, actually, because there's like five, and maybe it's the sort of early stages of tourism, when people first come to Europe, they want to tick things off. And so you see it even within the Louvre, there are like five pictures that you can't get close to because everybody's posing in front of them with their selfie sticks. But the rest of the Louvre is fine. You know, you can see the, the whole of the rest of the museum uh, quite well. And again, you know, I, I mentioned Cambridge, a small place which is now really creaking under the impact of tourism. So I would appeal to you, in the interest of sharing out the economic cake, but also perhaps making taking the pressure off some of the most obvious sites. If you can do a great job, not just of marketing Europe, but of marketing the diversity of Europe and of persuading people that there's lots to see and not just the Mona Lisa, that would be great. But I'll leave it there and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.
Okay, um, I looked at my mind as we've got a time for a couple of questions here. I mean, I've got about 12, but <laughs> would anybody like to get ahead of me in the queue? Um, stick up a hand if you'd like to. No, no. Let me have a. Let me start it off then. Um, Gideon, you you've um, looked at the question of tourism in Europe from inside and out, uh, exactly as um, requested. And I wonder, we heard earlier on from the two speakers from Brussels about a fair amount about heritage. Mm. It seems to me that, therefore, I mean, Europe inevitably is about you know, Gothic cathedrals, beautiful views, preserved things from the past. Not only that, but pr mm. significantly that. Whereas the Far East is a completely different world, uh, also in the sense that it's creating exotic skylines, modernity at its most um, obvious. So I wonder whether, you know, in a sense, there's almost a division of labor potentially there between the hyper-modern, which you'd get in um, the Far East and arguably parts of the Americas, Europe, which can do the hyper-modern, mm. but is still the place more than anywhere where the old world, in a good sense, is available. And is that a... a, a yeah, a I, 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 th I, think, I think there is something in that. Um, I think that, uh, particularly for the Chinese, where development's been so rapid, yep. it's created almost a sense of disorientation right. that people think, you know, uh, you know, people complain, all over the world have something to complain about. And one of the things the Chinese sometimes complain about is that you know, we've kind of, we've become so materialistic and so focused on uh, rapid economic development that we've lost a sense of what, you know, who we are, what we, what we are spiritually. And I think that there's a, there is an admiration. Actually, I've heard them say this about India as much as about Europe, that although the Indians are, you know, poorer and, and actually sometimes look down upon for that, for that reason in East Asia, there is a sense that, you know, maybe Indian culture has a more, has retained a kind of spiritual aspect. And I mm -hmm. think similarly, with Europe, there's a belief that there's a continuity here, a tradition, and I think that, you know, if you look at all the imagery that Britain laid on for Xi Jinping when he was here last week, you know, to some of the, some of the Brits, I think, were slightly rolling their eyes at all the, you know, the, the carriages and the Buckingham Palace stuff, but that stuff does go over very well, and I think not just because it's sort of glitzy and so on, but also because it speaks to continuity, that, you know, that this country's been around a long time and that there's, you're tapping into that, rather than the, the, I mean, China, it's complicated because Xi Jinping himself, I think he said in his speech, we have 2,500 years of history, and they are very conscious of continuity and they'll make references back to, uh, you know, thousands of years ago as something that's relevant. On the other hand, recently they've had incredible abrupt shifts, you know, the Cultural Revolution, the Great Leap Forward, including actually the destruction of a lot of cultural heritage. Um, so yeah, I think in, in brief, uh, Europe's ability to market itself as uh, somewhere with a, a preserved past is, is very important. I always thought European art house films do this yeah. to myself, but there we are, yeah. especially, especially Italy and Rome, but that's yeah. another day. No more? Right, we're going to move on. Gideon, okay. thank you very much indeed. That was wonderful. My Thanks ever so much. Sure. Thanks.